What's up guys, Jake here. In this video, we're gonna talk about life insurance, potentially who needs it and what kind. And there are two kinds of life insurance. There is term life insurance and whole life insurance, sometimes called permanent life insurance. And before we get into the details, let me first just tell you that I'm not selling you anything in this video. This video is definitely not sponsored. I don't have any referral links. I'm not gonna direct you towards any of these potential companies. These are the main players uh, in the life insurance industry. And when you talk to a financial advisor or financial planner, they're definitely gonna try and sell you life insurance. And the bigger the policy they can sell you, the more money they make. Your financial planner, advisor, is working on commissions partnered with these companies. So for example, if they sign you up for a whole life insurance policy, typically your financial advisor will receive a commission from one of these companies up to 80% or 100% of the first year premiums. So at 500 a month, your financial advisor, planner, whoever, can receive a commission of six grand today. If they, for example, sign you up with a term life policy of $50 a month, then they're making $600 a day. So just remember the potential conflict of interest when they're trying to sell you on the most expensive policy. Now, who needs life insurance? And I would argue that if you're working and your income is required to support a spouse, children, or an elderly parent not secure in their own retirement, then don't even second guess yourself. This isn't, this isn't a, a trick question here. If your income is providing for anybody else that you love and care about, then 100% you should get life insurance. The question is, what kind? Now, before we go any further, just make sure that your loved ones know about the policy in the un unfortunate event that you were to pass away. They can find that policy and cash it in in order to receive the payment as soon as possible. Now, the first and easiest form of life insurance to understand is term life insurance. And when you partner with a company, they're gonna ask you a bunch of questions and require a medical exam, depending on your age, your occupation, your medical history, uh, and how much you want to be covered for, $500,000, $1,000,000, $1 $1.5 million. They're gonna determine what your premium payments per month is, and you're locked in to that payment every month for the, uh, the term of the contract. So you can do 10, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. Now, at the end of the policy, when the policy expires, you get nothing. So potentially you signed up for this when you were 30 and it was a 30 year policy. At 60, the contract is over, you're, you're, you're done. Now, you can extend it or renew it, but you're now 60 years old, for example. So the premiums are going to be much higher because the, the, the probability of you dying soon is, is much greater. And before we discuss whole life insurance, let's just first ask the question of how long do you need it? How long do you need to be covered with life insurance? Now, some people will just automatically default think, well, I'm gonna die someday. I want my children or my life partner to be protected. I want them to receive a payment. For that reason, people look at term life insurance and they say, well, I'm more likely gonna die when I'm older than 60 years old. So why would I only do a certain uh, fixed time period? And this is actually the important question about life insurance. Who needs it and when do you need it? So when you're young and working, potentially you have a lot of debt. Maybe you have student loans, a mortgage, you have children who are very young, and you're saving for retirement. There's money going into your 401k or IRA that potentially you can't use today to maybe pay down your mortgage. So for that reason, if you were to unexpectedly die young, your family's gonna be in trouble. This is when the money is needed. However, think about where you want to be financially in 30 years. Ideally, uh, your children are grown up and financially independent now, your mortgage is paid off, you're over the age of 60, so you can live on your retirement savings and your 401k or IRA. So aren't you rich yet? What do you need a $500,000 life insurance policy for? Yes, if you kick the bucket when you're 65, it'd be nice if your spouse got a $500,000 payment, but you need to ask yourself, do you need the policy and do you need the money? 
If you've done everything right financially over 30 years, then I argue you don't need life insurance when, when you're more likely to die. So the idea of life insurance is that it is very important when you are young and working and you have people dependent on you. But it's not really essential once you're older and people are not dependent on you. And ideally you've been saving and investing for 30 years and if you were to pass away, your family is well taken care of. However, that line of thinking is too simple for the insurance companies, so they invented this convoluted alternate system called whole life insurance. And how this works is there is no expiration of the policy. So when you sign up for it and maybe age 30, they assume you're going to live to either be 100 or 120 years old. So this is a 70 year policy and the premiums are fixed. They do not change. So you're locking in a very expensive rate today, but given the way that inflation works over time, it shouldn't be too burn burdensome later in life. And you're guaranteed death benefits. If you keep paying the premiums every month, the policy is still valid. Eventually you will die. Now to make it extra complicated, they created something called the cash value of your policy. And this is a tax deferred investment account within your whole life insurance policy. There's something weird called infinite banking. I'll talk about that in a different video, but basically you can borrow against the balance in the accounts and then pay it back with interest. Why are you paying to borrow your own money? This is something that doesn't make sense to me. Initially, additionally, they'll talk about this account earning dividends over time that will reduce the premium you pay each month. But once again, you're still net paying more than what you're, you're getting for this cash value. And this whole business idea to me is very bizarre that it's even been normalized. For example, let's pretend I could say to you, how would you like the opportunity to pay hundreds of dollars per month more for your auto insurance? And then your auto insurance provider is going to invest that money for you to give a cash value for your auto insurance policy that you could then cash out at any point. Who, who would sign up for that? And the premiums you're paying every month for the whole life insurance policy are split between the death benefits and the cash value of the policy. And it's not a 50-50 split. So when you're young and you sign up for a whole life insurance policy, most of the money you're paying every month in premiums is going towards paying off the death benefits. And then over time, an increasing amount of money is going towards the cash value of the, of, of the accounts. And this is attractive to some people because this is a tax deferred investing account. The insurance companies are managing this money for you. So it's kind of like active management and you can cancel your whole life policy at any time and cash out the cash value of this account that's been growing over time. But you need to know, and we'll talk more about this later, the insurance company keeps the cash value of whatever is growing in here should the death benefit be used. So you only get one of these, not both. So let's do an example because that always helps me understand best. And let's assume that uh, SpongeBob and Patrick are 40 year old healthy men that want to sign up for health insurance policies. SpongeBob is gonna go with term and Patrick is gonna go with whole life. Now this is gonna be a 30 year policy starting at age 40. So for SpongeBob, this is gonna expire at age 70. The death benefit is $500,000 uh, for, for a payout and it's going to cost him $52 a month. Now you can go on the website and get quotes or estimates. This is what I did, but I don't wanna direct you towards anyone specifically. So at $52 a month, think about how much is SpongeBob paying over time? $52 a month times 30 years. SpongeBob is going to be putting into this policy about $18,720. But let's think about the opportunity cost of SpongeBob not investing this money because he decided to sign up for a life insurance policy that might never be used, this is $18,000 he could have invested instead. Suppose he instead put that money into an S&P 500 index fund in an ordinary brokerage account, how much could he have had? And if we assume that there's an 8% annual growth rate and the S&P 500 with dividends reinvested is about 10% a year, but let's be pessimistic and say 8%, 
then over 30 years, SpongeBob could have had $76,000 in his account. Now, I think this is actually a pretty good uh, payment for the benefits. So you're, 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 you're paying 18,000 over 30 years with an opportunity cost of not investing at 76,000, but you're guaranteed this 500,000 should the worst case scenario occur. But let's now check in with Patrick who has the whole life insurance policy. Now, this is a, once again, whole life, but we're just going to examine it over a 30 year period to compare it against SpongeBob's 30 year term policy. Once again, the benefit is $500,000 and Patrick is gonna have to pay $560 a month. So over a 30 year period, how much is he putting into this policy? 560 times 12 times 30, over a 30 year period, he's putting in $201,000. That's a lot of money. What if instead he said, screw it, I'm not doing whole life insurance and just invested all of this money, uh, 6,720 a year into S&P 500 index funds that over 30 years average 8%, he would have $822,000 in his brokerage account. I'm not making this up. This is exactly what would happen. Uh, if, if, if you can expect uh, on average an 8% return over a 30 year period, if Patrick had just skipped the whole life insurance policy and just invested it instead. And when talking to the person selling you on the whole life insurance policy, they're gonna advertise that this cash value account will get you about 5.5% return on your investment per year. However, this 5.5% is before commissions and fees. Everybody is gonna get paid before your account grows in value. So when you actually look at whole life insurance policies and what, what it's growing at per year, not counting the deposits, it's actually closer to 2% a year, which is pretty disappointing because some years it's not even beating inflation. So what is the estimate on the cash value in the policy over a 30 year period? And it's about $275,000. So over a 30 year period, you put in $201,000, you were always protected up to a half a million should you pass away. And the cash value you'll have after 30 years, in addition to still having the policy, is $275,000. That's how they're going to sell it to you in the brochures. Is that, a good, is that a good return? Is this a good deal? And I would argue no, because these health insurance companies have to be making money somehow. If they're making money, some, the customer has to be paying something. So let's look at the opportunity cost here. So let's say SpongeBob has the exact same salary as Patrick, and he, he, he still signs up for a 30-year term policy costing him $52 a month, but he chooses to invest the difference. So Patrick is paying 560, 560 minus 52 is 508. He's going to instead invest $508 a month into S&P 500 index fund, buy and hold forever. If you don't sell, you're not paying taxes year to year. So contributing $6,000 over 30 years at an 8% rate, SpongeBob is gonna have $745,000 in his brokerage account, investing the same amount as Patrick is. So comparing how much money SpongeBob has invested versus Patrick, it's 275,000 versus 745,000. How can there be a half a million dollar difference between their accounts? And the reason why is because this is where the money's going, guys. So think about this and it actually gets even worse. So Patrick is still paying this 560 for whole life insurance. This is one day after the policy for both people expire. If SpongeBob can renew his policy uh, after 30 years for an additional 10, an additional 20 or whatever, and just be paying less than $560 a month for Patrick's whole life policy, then SpongeBob is out is half a million dollars ahead of where Patrick is basically. And it gets even worse because you also have to factor in, let's say Patrick dies uh, one day later. The policy is still in effect the beneficiary will get $500,000, but there was 275 in this cash, this, this, this cash value part of the policy and the health insurance companies reclaim this. They take it back. Your, your next of kin or beneficiary doesn't get it. So what is the value of the life insurance policy? 
it's no longer $500,000. It's 500,000 minus the cash value of your account, 275. So net, your, your beneficiary, how much are they actually getting? They're only getting 225,000 because this 275 was already a guarantee. You could have cashed it out, uh, given it to your beneficiary. So how much more money uh, are, are you getting from the whole life insurance policy being exercised at 30 years and one day? It's only $225,000. But once again, if you had just gone with term life insurance and invested the difference, you would have had over a 30 year period, a, a half a million dollars more than the whole life insurance per person. So, I mean, factor in that opportunity cost and this just gets ridiculous how much money these uh, insurance companies are, are taking people for. We definitely can crunch the imaginary numbers all day and show how bad whole life insurance is, but it, it does come down to the question of how long do you need it? And I, I still argue that you don't need it your whole life. If you're doing everything right over these 30 years, then you shouldn't need to guarantee a $500,000 death benefit to a child or spouse. You, you ideally have paid off your mortgage and, and you've already secured enough investments so that your family is taken care of once you pass away. Okay guys, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. In addition, if you have any comments or questions, let me know down below. I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care.